Good morning, church. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I'm uh, sitting here uh, for this introduction here out on the front lawn of our church where we often on this day would have a sunrise service. The sun is coming up beautifully behind me uh, here. And uh, the reason we do sunrise service or uh, many churches do is because this is the time of the day that we are told the first people went to the tomb and discovered that it was empty. I want to read for you uh, from John 20, 1 through 10 about this. It says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and he believed. This message of Easter is always so important to us each and every year that we remember uh, that Jesus died on a cross for our sins and that he rose on the third day, overcoming, overcoming death. And, and, and this tragedy of the cross turns into this triumph, this new life on Easter morning. And that is sure a message we could sure use this year and each and every year. Uh, that in the midst of all of the tragedy, uh, the Lord is triumphant. We have an eternal life in him. We have joy in the Lord. We have a peace that passes understanding in him because he goes with us. We have a living hope that cannot perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for us. We serve a risen Lord who is with us today and every day. I sure hope that message of hope will fill your heart. We have a great service for you today. Cody Johnson, a ninth grader from our church, is going to be playing Christ the Lord is Risen today on his trumpet. He's part of the Waverly Band, and he plays it beautifully. And then we have a beautiful song by our worship team called Glorious Day uh, that uh, you can look up on your phone the lyrics of if you'd like and sing along with them as they play it. And then Jessica Eden will be given a kid's moment and then I'll give a message on the three uh, people who first saw Jesus alive and what their stories teach us. And then we'll close with a few of the women from our church who are singing uh, the song, Jesus Paid It All. And it is a beautiful way to end our time together. Um, even though we are not together physically here um, this morning, we are together in spirit celebrating all around this world, Christ the Lord is risen today.
Good morning, kids, and happy Easter. Um, I have something to share with you this morning. Do you know what's inside here? I'll give you a little peek. Easter eggs, you were right. And I have a feeling that many of you maybe went on an Easter hunt earlier this morning, or perhaps you get to do an Easter egg hunt this afternoon. And oh, it is so fun to go searching for those little eggs and see the prizes inside. Now, I love Easter for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons I love Easter is because my favorite candy comes out at Easter time. Mm, they are tropical starburst jelly beans. I just love them. Do you have a favorite candy at Easter time? Maybe whisper to your mom or dad or your grandma or grandpa or family member about what your favorite Easter candy is. Mm, I just love those jelly beans. Well, the neat thing about these Easter eggs is what's inside is way better than any type of candy, even yours or mine at Easter time. Now inside these, these are a special type of Easter egg. They are called resurrection eggs. Now I made these by myself at home and you can too. In the Easter bags you got last week from church, your mom or dad probably saw this sheet called DIY resurrection eggs. And these eggs are just things you can gather at home. And what they do is they tell the story of Jesus's week into Jerusalem as well as his death and resurrection. So you can gather these items together and put them in these Easter eggs and learn about the story of Easter. Now, I just want to share a few of the eggs with you today, and then you can do the rest later. The first egg I want to share with you is egg number one. Let's see. Inside is a leaf or maybe a palm branch. Now you remember from last week, we made those beautiful palm mats and people would wave them in the air. And this leaf is to remind you about the victory Jesus has and his entry into the city. Very exciting. So this is our palm leaf. The next egg I want to share is egg number four. And inside egg number four are crackers. In my case, animal crackers. Now these crackers talked about the last time that Jesus had dinner with all of his best friends on earth. They would call this the Last Supper, and we celebrated this this last Thursday. This was when Jesus got together and told his friends about what was going to come. The next egg I want to share is egg number eight. And inside egg number eight, now this is a big one, It's a cross. Can you see that? It's really little. And this cross reminds us of Jesus' death on the cross. He took all of our sins and died on the cross to take away our sins, and he took them all for us. That's a big one. Now, the last one I want to tell you about is egg number 12, but I'm not going to show you what's inside. This is the most important egg and tells us all about the Easter story. This is the big one, but I'm not going to show you what's inside, but I think it's the most important part of Easter yet. So you can spend some time with your family making your own resurrection eggs and figuring out what's in egg number 12. So have a wonderful Easter, have great Easter egg hunts, and maybe you too can even enjoy some of your favorite Easter candy. Bye guys. I want to read for you now the, uh, the ending of the story that I began on the front lawn of our church there. I want to read for you from John 20, now beginning in verse 11, as they, we now see uh, three different times when Jesus appears on that, on that first uh, week there to his disciples and to Mary. Let's read beginning in verse 11 of John 20. It says this, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Those angels asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was him. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? 
Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. And then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus says, don't hold too much to me, for I have yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to the Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene did go to the disciples with the news, saying, I have seen the Lord. And she told them all that he had said to her. On the evening of that same day, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fears of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and he then stood among them. And he said, Peace be with you. (laughs) And after he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am now sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. (laughs) But he said, Unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and my hand upon his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas this time was with them. And though the doors were again locked, Jesus there stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then right to Thomas, he said, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and touch my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you believed. But blessed are those who have not seen And yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these have been written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. I love Easter. I am, be honest with you, I am missing that you are all not here. Uh, This day that I might be able to to look upon you. I look into this camera and imagine you all there and and try to picture you in my mind and see your faces and and your kids and that and um, but I am missing you today. If I were to be honest, I I always enjoy Easter gathering out on that front lawn and and having Wilma play the hymns there as we we sing some as we kick off. I miss the the breakfast downstairs or Darlene putting the flowers into the cross and helping us make a beautiful flower cross. I miss seeing the kids out on the back lawn there going after their eggs and uh, and then gathering here for worship. The the place always so full with praise and celebration as we remember our Lord. My I'm missing that this year. Uh, But my heart is still full of joy and thanksgiving, as I hope yours is too. Because the Lord is alive. And nothing can separate us from Him and His love this day. He is not dead. Our God is not dead. Our Savior is not in a grave. He is with us. This faith that we have is not uh, just a religion. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ who goes with us every day of our lives, even now. He is there with us in our house. He is there with us around our table, in our living room. Our God is with us. He is there. And if you're having trouble seeing Him today, just close your eyes and say, Lord... I know you are here. May I feel your presence this day. For he is with you every day of your life. He lives. Our God lives. And no matter if we are homesick or we are driving off to work or we are sitting in a classroom or laying in a hospital bed, even if our family can't be near us or our friends, he is there. I love that about our scripture. It says that even when the disciples are locked away in a room, hiding away, 
Jesus appears right to them. He is there. No tomb can hold him. No locked doors can keep him away from you. He is risen. The Bible tells us that over 500 people saw Jesus risen and alive before he ascended into heaven. 500 people got to personally talk to him one more time or look upon the nail marks in his hands and his feet like Thomas does here. 500 people were witnesses to the greatest miracle that has ever happened on planet Earth. Talk about winning the lottery to be one of those 500 people who got to see with their own eyes Jesus risen and to know for certain He is Lord. I wonder today who was one of those 500. I wonder if Lazarus, his friend, was one of those 500. I wonder about Zacchaeus or Joseph of Arimathea who lent Jesus the tomb. Or I wonder if Nicodemus, who was one of those Pharisees who who did believe. Or I wonder if the Samaritan woman at the well or Mary, his own mother. Did Jesus appear to marry his own mother, I wonder again, to assure her broken heart? I wonder if they were part of the chosen ones, the 500, to get to see him alive again. I don't know all of who they were, but I know that all of them see him now (laughs) as we will one day because he lives. We are not told of everyone who got to see Jesus alive in person before he ascended into heaven. But we are given a glimpse into a few of the people and their reactions when they see him alive again. In our scripture from John this morning, we see a few. We see Mary Magdalene. She's the first to see the Lord. The disciples are the second. And then Thomas, that one disciple who wasn't with the others, uh, the The other 10. And so they call him Doubting Thomas because of his story. But he's the third one we see here in our chapter who sees him risen. And so I want to reflect for us this morning a bit on their stories as we celebrate Easter Easter this year and remember that he is alive. Uh, He is risen from the dead and he is alive. And he is with us this very day and one day eternally in heaven. So I want to look at these three witnesses and their interactions with Jesus and how they might encourage us this Easter. The first to see him was Mary Magdalene. We are told that she went to the tomb early on the first day of the week, Sunday. While it was still dark, she went as early as she possibly could. She couldn't wait. She loved Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus had healed her of many demons. It also tells us from Scripture that Mary had lived a difficult life. She was, had been a prostitute and a, world, a whole world had rejected her and despised her. But our God loved her. He saw her. It makes me think of Hagar. Uh, She was in the Old Testament, was a slave girl. She was despised by her master and found herself cast out and alone with a child in a cruel world. She had nothing. She was despised and rejected by the world alone. And she prayed that God would not let her and her son die. She couldn't bear watching her son die die and she had nothing to feed him or care for him and so she prays uh, there in the book of Genesis we see her story and as she prays God hears her and comes to her and rescues her and provides for her and Hagar so full of thankfulness at God's salvation she calls God El Rohai which means the God who sees me. When no one else does, and no one else seems to care, our God does. How incredible it is to be seen, to be known, to be heard. In our world, there are many people in the shadows. Many children in homes who live unloved and unseen and despised. People look right past them. 
many people in our world who, who no one knows the name of. But our God sees them, every one of them. He knows them so well. And he knows their name. I have told a few of you this story before, but when I was still in seminary, I had to complete three months of chaplain work at the Swedish Covenant Hospital down the road. And, and I would get called in and I would make rounds to the patients, to the new patients. And, and I would pray with people and in the ER and so forth. Well, this one night I got called to come in uh, because a homeless man had been beaten up and left for dead on the streets of Chicago. And the police had found him and brought him into the hospital. And he was in a coma in the ICU and was not expected to make it through the night. So I went there and I entered into his room and no one was there. Most of the time when I would come to a place um, and enter into a room, uh, where someone was dying or sick, there was always somebody there. Somebody holding that person's hand or crying over them. Or This man had no one. His room was empty. He lay there in his bed motionless with a breathing tube and wires. And I remember uh, how dirty he was. How dirty his clothes were, uh, caked with mud and probably months worth of, of filth and and I sat there beside his bed, and I just felt sorrow in my heart. And then alone in that room with this man, I suddenly began to feel the presence of God there. Just as you would in church or in prayer, I felt the presence of God there. I felt that God was there too. And then I began to feel all of this love for this man come over me. God's love. In a world that can be so harsh, I began to feel for this stranger that I didn't know. I began to wonder what it was like for him. Wonder what he was like and what was of his life and, and how did he end up in this place? Did he have a mom or a dad? I wondered who was who cared or was still living. I didn't know. Had they been good parents or, or not to him? I didn't know. Did he have brothers or sisters? I wondered, you know, and what happened? I, I began to think of how he would have been maybe as a little boy, because at one time he would have been a little child going off to kindergarten or, or maybe had a date for prom. Or, and I began to wonder what happened to this man's life that he would end up like this. Only God knows. But I began to feel for him. I felt sorrow for his life. And I didn't even know him. And then I felt all this love in me for him. And again, I didn't know him. But it was like the Lord alive in me. And in that moment, I was his hands and his feet. And to be present for his child so that he wouldn't have to die alone. Because someone did love him. And someone did know his name. The Lord our God. The nurses tried to. Uh, came into the room. They tried to figure out this man's name. He had a wallet. Uh, but no ID or anything. And there was one phone number in the wallet. And so they called it. And it was of a, a woman and she came immediately and she was so sweet. She was his friend. She helped him a few times and she was so kind. She didn't care that his hands were dirty. She just grabbed him and held on tight to them. She didn't care that his face was bloodied and covered in dried blood. She held those hands and she kissed that face and she wept over him. 
And sitting in that room, all of a sudden I could see that besides the Lord who was there, he did have someone who loved him. So this, this man, he had the Lord and he had his friend. And when he died that night, he was not alone. We prayed for him. And I don't know his heart or his faith, but I remember praying that our Lord, who died for all this world and who rose to give everlasting life, I prayed that he would give it to this man. And he is one of the seven billion people on this earth who has a story that I pray is in paradise today because our Savior died and rose again. He is just one of those people that I think about on Easter. I tell his story because the first person who got to see the Savior alive was Mary. And she too was an unknown in the world. But she was known by him. She was a sinner. <laughs> She was saved by his grace. She was a prostitute that the world had rejected and ignored. But whom Jesus saw and loved. Jesus was a friend of sinners. He loved them and showed up for them. He knew their name. And that is what I love so much about Mary's story at the tomb. For she comes to the tomb early because Jesus was her friend. She shows up for him and she was going to anoint his body with perfumes like was their custom back then. She's providing a great gift, but Jesus isn't there. The stone has been rolled away and she didn't know what happened. She assumed the worst that someone had stolen the body. She assumed some people who maybe didn't like him very much had taken him away. And I think this is so true. This happens so many times in our life that God does amazing and wonderful things like rise from the dead, but we don't know it yet. We can't see it yet what God is up to. So at first glance, we think something bad is really happening when the truth is something good has just happened. But because of our lack of understanding and our fears, we assume the worst. We fear the worst when God is really amazing and he's doing something amazing. But Mary couldn't see it yet. So in a panic, she goes and she gets the disciples and, and wants their help to figure all this out. She wants their help to find Jesus. And so Peter and John, they run to the tomb. They look in. Peter goes straight into the tomb. He examines the grave clothes there that are left behind. The face cloth which has been folded and left on the bench. And, and he thinks to himself, if somebody is trying to steal this body, wouldn't they have taken all of this? Would, would they have taken the time to, to unwrap all the grave clothes? Uh, would they have taken the time to fold up the face cloth? It doesn't make sense to him. Jesus had told those disciples three times that he was going to Jerusalem to be arrested, crucified in the third day rise, but they didn't understand. They couldn't put all the pieces together. But I wonder if Peter and John in that moment, I wonder if they began to put the pieces together as they looked at the evidence, as they remembered Jesus's word. Maybe that is why it says that John, when he looks in, he believes. He looks at the, flat, the facts. Jesus is gone. The, the cloth's laid behind. Jesus believes before he sees. But Mary, Mary, she still doesn't understand. It, she wasn't there when Jesus said those things about dying and rising again. She doesn't know this yet. She's just there and she's missing her friend and she doesn't have him. She hasn't had a chance to say goodbye. And so she remains at the tomb when the disciples go back to tell the others. She remains at the tomb, Mary does, and she is crying there still. When suddenly into her world, two angels appear. And they are seated right there where Jesus' body had been laid. 
And they ask her a question, woman, why are you crying? And she tells them, they've taken my Lord, I don't know where they've put him. And as she explains it, suddenly he, she hears somebody from behind her. She turns around, she sees a figure of somebody, but she can't make out who it is. She assumes that it is the card, gardener. He asks her two women, why are you crying? And she says again, they've taken my Lord away. I don't know where they've put him. If you've put him somewhere, just tell me where you've put him and I will go and get him. And then the great moment comes. When Jesus calls her by name, he says, Mary. And at the sound of her name, she knows it's him. And she runs to embrace him at the sound of her name. A name is so important. It means I am known, I exist, I have worth. He knows me. When God saw Hagar and helped her and her son in a world that had ignored him, she said, God, you are El Rohi, the God who sees me, knows me, knows my name, my story, my suffering. And in the same way, when Jesus says, Mary, it communicates, Mary, I know you. <laughs> you know me. I know you. <laughs> I know your story. I know your pain. Mary had a life. And it wasn't the life that she maybe had hoped for when she was a little girl. It didn't turn out. Life hadn't turned out like she had expected. Uh, she had pain. A alert world looked upon her all those years with condemnation. But then Jesus came into her life, got to know her, loved her, saved her, knew her. And so when he calls her by name there, Outside that tomb, she knows it's him. Her eyes are opened and she has been given the gift of being the first one to see him again. And again, I am so glad that it is her because it again reveals more of who our God is. He is a God of compassion and mercy and love who is with people in their sufferings and shame. The same God who invited shepherds uh, off to the manger is the same one who appears to a prostitute woman after his resurrection. Psalm 139 says that God feels towards us, each of us, the same. He loves us and knows us. It says, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths and the alleys and the gutters of life, you are still there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn or I settle on the far side of the sea, you are there with me. If even the darkness is so thick around me. Psalm 139 says, it is not dark to you. For you created me, you knit me together in my mother's womb. And I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Mary reminds us in the story of Easter. Just how much we are loved and seen and how he knows our name. Like that man in Swedish Covenant Hospital. To you and me. He knows our name. He's present there. In our life. The second person to see him. Alive again were the disciples. 
They had been with Jesus for three years. Most of them were men between the ages of 17 and 30. They were mostly uneducated, a ragtag group of fishermen and rebels, tax collectors. There was a zealot and two brothers called the Sons of Thunder. They were hardly the group of priests that we would think of. They were a misfit group of disciples. Peter was the oldest and the leader. John was the youngest. And so what we read in, in the, at the resurrection is that the oldest and the youngest, they come running to the tomb when they hear from Mary. And John's the younger. He runs the fastest. He gets there first. And then Peter follows and goes straight in. And as I had already kind of spoken, when they looked in, it says that they believed. They believed before they saw him alive. They believed just on the evidence of what they had before them. And I wonder, have you ever believed before seeing? This is an important question to ask each of us as Christians. Have you ever trusted God even when it looked impossible or scary? Have you ever just taken God at his word and given him a chance to prove himself to you? Over and over. This is what we call faith. And in the Gospels, we read that the Lord often looked for faith before he did a miracle. He didn't require a large amount of faith, but even just a mustard seed of faith would do. Even just a little bit of humility, even just a little bit of turning towards him was all it took for Jesus to heal or save or forgive. We have so many stories like this. Like the woman with a bleeding illness. Who, who reached out in faith to touch him. And was healed. Or the leper who came back to say thank you. Or the blind man who kept on calling for Jesus to come. Knowing that Jesus could heal him of his blindness. Or the centurion who came on behalf of his servant. All of them showed faith. And a miracle came. Peter did too. He trusted the Lord to walk on water. Peter said, Lord, if you call me out of this boat, I know that I can walk on that water too. And Jesus said, come out to me then. And Peter got out of that boat and he walked on water. He believed before he saw. We must learn as Christians how to believe before we see. To look upon God and his word. To see the evidence of him around us and to trust in him before we see. To know that in him all things are possible. So Peter and John, when they first come to the tomb, they look into the tomb and they may not have ever understood everything. But they still believe. And later that night, Jesus shows up for them. The Bible tells us that the disciples were all together. They're probably in the Last Supper room where they had been a, a few nights earlier. They're all there except for Thomas, who wasn't, and then Judas, of course, uh, who had betrayed Jesus and went and hung himself. So ten of them are there, and they're there, it tells us, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. Now, the disciples, they all are Jews, and yet they're afraid now of their own people and their, their, or their own leaders because their own leaders were the ones who crucified their teacher and Lord. And so they're fearing about the same, that, that those people will come now and try to get them and kill them. So they lock the doors and they remain in hiding. But Jesus appears to them in the evening of that first day. He suddenly is in the room with them physically. He wasn't a ghost. He was risen. He was there again in the room that he had celebrated the Passover with them days before. He's there again. And his first words to them are, peace be with you. That word is shalom. It means it's okay. It's well. Peace. Don't fear. You're okay. Don't be afraid. I'm here. He then shows them his hands, his feet, and his side, and they are overjoyed, it says. But what I love about this second appearance of Jesus is what he does next. He doesn't just show up and say, hey, I'm alive. <laughs> he says to them this, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then it says he breathed on them the breath of God, and they received the Holy Spirit. So to a group of guys 
that would change the world, who would be his apostles, the sent ones, his witnesses, who would write the gospels and deliver the message first and ultimately give their life for it. To them who he had spent three years raising up for this very moment, who were presently in hiding away from the world, Jesus told them, go in peace. <laughs> Don't be afraid. And then he sends them out into the world, giving them a purpose, a meeting, providing for them everything they would need. The Holy Spirit, he is enough. They have his teaching. They now have the Holy Spirit. They've seen him. They have everything they're going to need now. The Holy Spirit is the presence of Christ in our life today. Jesus told them when the Holy Spirit would come upon them, that they would receive power to be his witnesses in all of the world. They would be able to do everything that he had been doing and even more. Through the Holy Spirit, they would be able to speak his words and lives would be changed and heal in his name and love as he loved. God would be working through his people, the church, he told him, his people to accomplish his purposes. The Holy Spirit is our counselor and, and guide who reminds us of everything that Jesus taught and empowers us to live and live and serve our God. He is God in us. We are not God, but he comes to make his home in us. Part of the miracle of the resurrection is the presence of God is now with his people. Not in a building or in a temple, but in us. The Holy Spirit alive in us every day. The presence and power of God with his people. No longer just in a temple in Jerusalem or with a particular priest. But the Bible says he makes each of us the priests now. And he makes his temple in us now. God's presence goes with you every moment of every day because he lives. And he empowers each of us to be his witnesses in a world that is lost and hurting. So Jesus, when he appears this second time, when he appears to his disciples, he gives them something to do, a purpose and a mission to not keep what they know to themselves, but to go out of hiding and to live their life in this world on purpose, to be a light in the darkness, to tell other people about him. It is what he has trained them to do. Just as the Father sent Jesus, Jesus now sends them. On my first trip to Israel, I had gone with a friend and we had seen this amazing stuff for two weeks. We had walked where Jesus walked. We looked upon the place where he was crucified. We went and saw the garden tomb, which was empty. We saw the Sea of Galilee and all these places that Jesus did, all these miracles. We were reading the Bible every day. We were praying every day. Um, I was alive in my faith. It was like a kid coming out of camp, you know, coming off a mountaintop experience just excited being a Christian, you know. Well, we had one day left in Israel before going back, and it was going to be in Tel Aviv. And so when we were in Tel Aviv, we went to the beach there at the Mediterranean Sea. And since I had been bringing my Bible everywhere else I had gone for two straight weeks, I brought my Bible down to the beach too. But Tel Aviv is not like Jerusalem. Jerusalem is, is a, like a holy city, a religious place. It's like church. Everywhere you go, everyone's carrying their Bibles or religious books and praying. You just fit in if you're doing that. But Tel Aviv is not like that. It's, it's just a modern city. It's like walking in the streets of New York or Chicago or going to the beach in Florida or something like that. And so for two weeks... It was easy to live out my faith in, in God because everybody around me was doing it. But going to that beach in Tel Aviv, it was like going back to school now or, or to work or to the mall where, where, where not everybody's doing it. And so what I mean in this is that when I walked onto the beach, I noticed my own fears rising up again, fears of living out my faith in public or being true to, to who I was and not being afraid of what people may think. And it might sound stupid, but I hid my Bible underneath my towel. 
And I felt ashamed in doing that. And when I sat down on the beach to read, before I used to read it, those two weeks before, just everywhere, and I was just glad and I was experiencing it. But when I pulled out my Bible to read on that beach, I was self-conscious looking around and kind of wondering and, and it kind of hid what I was doing. And I realized how quickly I can go into hiding. The disciples were in hiding behind locked doors for three years. They were out with Jesus, but now they had reasons to be a bit concerned. For Jesus had just been crucified. They feared for their lives. But what I want us to see is that Jesus appears to them, not just to say hello, but he comes to send them out into the world. It's where he needs them to go. Even if they are afraid, he'll help them. He gives them the Holy Spirit. He didn't just spend three years with them so they would stay behind those four walls. Nor does he just save us to stay behind ours. Even if they are stained glass, he saves us to fill us with his spirit that we might be his witnesses, a light in the darkness. And sometimes each of us, when we get out there in the world, we can kind of hide the most important thing about us and the most glorious truth we have to share. I love Romans 1.16, which says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. On this Easter Sunday, let's learn from the disciples here. And what Jesus teaches them. To not be afraid. Definitely not be ashamed. I don't know if we're living in the last days or not. But if we are. May the Lord when he comes not find his church in hiding but full of his spirit, serving and sharing and going into all the world. And now third, the last of the witnesses of the resurrection I want to mention here is Thomas. And Thomas was not with the other disciples when they first saw Jesus. And even though they try to tell him that it is true, he can't believe it. It's too much for him to believe that Jesus is alive. Even though Jesus said that he would rise from the dead. And even though his best friends are telling him, we've seen him. <laughs> he continues to doubt. That's why he's often called Doubting Thomas. He says, unless I see it for myself, I won't believe. Unless I put my finger where the nails were, I will not believe. Thomas wanted to see and touch. To know that it wasn't just a hallucination or a vision that these guys were having. Some made up thing that they were wanting to believe that but wasn't really true. And so into his doubts, Jesus comes. He comes next to Thomas. And he gives Thomas just what Thomas needed. And then he says, stop doubting and believe. And Thomas immediately falls to the ground and he says... My Lord and my God. And Jesus said, you believe because you see me. Blessed are those who will believe me even before they have seen. Now, I grew up in a Christian home. as Maybe many of you did. But I went to church every Sunday. I had a great youth group that helped me in my teenage years really own my faith. I've always kind of believed in Jesus. Over the years, I've gotten stronger in my faith. I've had moments of doubt for sure. Maybe not the doubting the existence of God, but doubts nonetheless. I have a lot of why questions. I have a lot of things that are mysteries that I don't know. I've seen a lot of pain and suffering in the world and wondered why. We all have. But I don't doubt God or the truth of Christ because I have seen him. In the darkest hour, I have felt him near. I have heard his voice in the whispers in my head. I have seen his hand at work. I have personally experienced the truth of him in so many ways. Today, I wish I could say that thing 
that would make you believe. I wish I could convince someone to trust God and to believe in Christ and to surrender their life and faith to Him because He's so real. In some way, I am like the disciples who are trying to convince their friend Thomas, dude, it's real. And all I can do is speak and pray because I am learning that just like Thomas, we each need the Lord to appear to us before we can truly say, my Lord and my God. I think of the great Easter hymn, He Lives. And the line of that song which says, you ask me how I know He lives he lives within my heart. I know because he lives in me. That's how I know. I know because he has come to me like Thomas. Not in physical, but in spirit, in word, in comfort, in help so many times. In guidance so many times. And all I can say today is my Lord and my God. You and I were not a part of those 500 who got to see Jesus physically alive before he ascended. We weren't there. But the word and testimony has been passed down to us now. And we have to choose whether we will believe in it or not. And in our doubts, if we are open to him, I promise you, the Lord will reveal himself to you personally. He will come to you and make himself known as he has come to me and so many others around this world. If we would just be open to him, pray to him, say, Lord, I want to believe. Help me in my unbelief. Lord, make yourself known unto me through the pages of this, by your spirit, through the testimony of others. May I see your hand at work. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. How is it the Lord is trying to get your attention today? How has he been trying to get you to see him lately? To know that he is real and that he is there. And that the truth of Christ who died for your sins and rose that you might have everlasting life in his name is the true reality in this world. The most true thing that has ever been. And how can it move each of us today from doubt to greater faith? So to Mary... Jesus calls her by name. He knew her. An unknown, despised and rejected by the world. But he knew her by name. To the disciples, Jesus says, peace. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Go, I am sending you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. And to Thomas, he makes himself known in a very real and personal way. And I pray that you would see him and know him too. Paul says there's nothing greater than knowing the Lord. All that he thought was something is nothing compared to the surpassing greatness, he says, of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord and being found in him every day, not having a righteousness of my own, but a righteousness that comes by faith. Romans 10.9 says, If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Won't you believe in him? The one who knows you and has always been right there. Won't you see him today? Put your faith in him today and experience the inexpressible joy and the amazing peace and the unconditional love that will flow into you from the risen one. John says, these things were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. And happy Easter, everyone.
Yeah.